And then you can go over and push play. Play here. That sounds better. Yeah.
these. All right, <laughs> we made it. <laughs> Good evening, happy uh, Tuesday evening to you. Uh, this is the uh, Ham Radio Extra Class, uh, and uh, tonight uh, we're going to be talking uh, about a lot of things that uh, could easily be crammed into uh, college level classes, semester long classes. We have two hours, that's our time limit. By the way, I'm Gary. Uh, ham radio call sign W4EEY, and uh, we work out of this book, uh, which is the American Radio Relay League's license manual for the extra class. Uh, this is the 12th edition, so it has the, the current uh, question pool uh, in the book. This is the, the one you'd want. And um, we're, uh, you know, coming along. I, I wanted to say we're almost midway through the class, but not quite. <laughs> There's a lot of material to come. We're going to try to cover everything in Chapter 5 tonight. There are three sections. We'll go through the first two sections. We'll take a break, and then we'll come back and, and finish it off with digital logic in one hour. Uh, so I just want to point out, we're just going to be barely skimming the surface on a lot of this material. Um, there are people who are subject matter experts on these topics far more than me. Uh, and um, so follow all of the links that you'll see in the presentation. Go to the URLs and, and check out because there's a wealth of additional information available. What we do is we try to laser focus in on the, the test questions uh, for, the, for the exam. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So without any further ado, are there any questions from anyone first in the group before we, we get started? All right, I don't see that. Let's go on over to the presentation. Chapter 5, Section 5.1, Semiconductor Devices. Hokey smokes. Um, all right, so I'm not a physicist. I'm certainly not an atomic physicist, but it all goes down to the atomic structure. And so here's a representation uh, of an atom. Uh, and uh, we have the, the protons and the neutrons uh, and the, the electrons spinning around the nucleus. We're going to talk more about uh, this uh, tonight and uh, how it relates to conductors and, and semiconductors. Uh, so carbon is, is a stable atom uh, and uh, it's an element. Uh, it has four uh, electrons in the outer ring and two other electrons in an inner ring. It's got the neutrons and protons in the, the nucleus, and in this case, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So we say that this is a stable atom. And uh, in stable atoms or unstable atoms, we have the outer ring uh, of electrons. That's called the valence ring. Uh, and so in this case here, we have uh, four in the outer ring. So this again is, is carbon. The octet rule. So we've been talking about single atoms here, um, but when we get atoms uh, connected to other atoms, when they're bonded together, the electrons occur in pairs, and these pairs often leave uh, bonded atoms with eight electrons in the outermost shell. It's called the octet rule. So just be aware of this. Uh, so the only exception for that is hydrogen, uh, where they, they bond uh, in, in this way, but um, the octet rule says that you're going to have shared pair here, shared pair here, shared pair here, shared pair here. So just be aware of that, hold that thought, and we'll come back to it here in a second. I love this quotation. The nice thing about standards is that there are so many of them to choose from. <laughs> so if you don't find a standard you like, you come up with another. Well, in electronics, uh, I'm old enough that I learned uh, electronics when vacuum tubes were still alive and roaming the earth. And uh, with electron, uh, the electron flow uh, of current was taught uh, at that time. And the electron flow says that electrons flow from the negative terminal on a battery through a load and back to the positive uh, end of the battery. So that is electron flow. Then along came semiconductors, and they found it easier to explain semiconductor theory using something called the conventional theory of current flow. And they say that conventional current flows from positive out to a load 
and back to the negative. So the electron theory corresponds to the flow of actual electrons, free electrons, while, whereas the conventional theory corresponds to the flow of holes. Uh, and you can see both of those things in this diagram right here, this animation. You can see the electrons, the green dots, you see them moving across. Uh, they're moving from the battery negative over to the battery positive, whereas the current, <laughs> the red, is flowing from positive to negative. I just point this out uh, that you may read in books and, and theories uh, about uh, you know, electronics. If you get an older book, you're going to see the, the older theory uh, as well. But also, that note, this shows you that both are true at the same time. Electrons moving from negative to positive, whereas current, as indicated by the red, flows from positive to negative. All right. So a good conductor, like copper, for example, on the left, that's able to move electrons uh, along or move holes uh, in the other direction. An insulator, there's no movement. There's no free electrons. There's, there's nothing happening. A semiconductor is, is somewhat in between. And the most popular uh, semiconductor material today is silicon. And you notice it has four electrons in the outer ring, the valence ring. Um, and when you put one atom, this is one atom of silicon, when you put them together with other atoms of silicon, they form together this matrix. It's a very, very strong matrix. Uh, it looks almost crystalline, and you will see that here in a second. And in a matrix like that, there, it is possible for electrons to flow through. But to make them flow through reliably in the way that you want them to do, you have to contaminate the silicon. And so what makes a usable semiconductor? <laughs> Something called dope. When you dope a semiconductor material with another atom, uh, then you can make it behave the way you want. So semiconductor devices, I, you know, I said I studied uh, electronics starting in the 1970s, and, and solid-state devices were, were coming along at, at that time, transistors, uh, the first integrated circuits. But really, semiconductor devices have been around since radio has been around. So the early use of semiconductor devices, and this is the, the merit badge for the Boy Scouts, um, think about crystal radios. Did any of you ever play with a crystal radio set uh, with a long wire antenna and one side of the radio then was connected to a ground or a water pipe in the house back when uh, water pipes were copper? Uh, and you had a, a high impedance headphones and you had a crystal radio set right here. Now this was kind of the nice one. Um, the more basic ones were kind of like this uh, and it had a, a wire that went down and touched, called the cat's whisker, and touched this material down below, which was called galena, a galena crystal, also known as lead sulfide or lead glance. This is a semiconductor with the, the copper wire coming down and touching. Uh, the junction there forms a diode and at that point in time, a diode is a nonlinear device, and AM radio broadcasts that were being received by your long wire antenna could be demodulated by this nonlinear device, and uh, the headphones would filter and hear only the modulation, and you'd be able to listen into radio using a very, very early semiconductor material. Now, when transistors first came into common use, though, uh, they were made out of germanium. Uh, germanium was the, the most um, common transistor uh, at first. It's still used in some solar panels and, and other electronics. Notice that it's really shiny and solid. Remember I said that it, they form these matrix or matrices. Uh, and, and so this is what a semiconductor material looks like. And uh, here's the, the atomic structure of, of the, uh, the germanium. Uh, and uh, here's an uh, animation of it as well. But again, the four valence electrons 
in the outer ring. So that was germanium. That was the first semiconductor material. As I mentioned, today silicon uh, is the most popular. Again, take a look at what it looks like. It's a really tight matrix of atoms together. And uh, again, we saw this one earlier. Here's the, the four valence electrons on the outer part. So with an insulator, conductor, and semiconductor, can uh, current flow through a semiconductor? It can, but not very well and not in a well-defined way. And when you're making semiconductor material, it's, it's actually made from sand uh, or silica. That's the basic material. And it comes out first as polycrystalline silicon. Uh, and it's later then refined through a, a process into single crystal silicon. So this is single crystal silicon. There's a seed crystal at the very top. And from that seed, you develop the matrix out until you've got this round area and this is sliced into wafers and then uh, the uh, semiconductor devices and whatnot can be uh, imposed on the silicon wafer wafers. So how do, how do you control the material again? It's by doping. You dope or add a, an impurity uh, and that will help you to make one of two different kinds of semiconductor material. N-type or P-type. Pure crystalline silicon is a poor conductor because there's really no free electrons to move about. But when silicon is doped with a minute amount of phosphorus, then it's called an N-type crystal. And when it's doped with boron, it's called a P-type material. N-type silicon has excess free electrons. P-type silicon material has excess holes, which remember were the absence of electrons. So uh, here, for example, um, is a, a phosphorus atom uh, donating its fifth valence electron. So you've got silicon doped in this case with phosphorus. It's got an extra electron that can't bond to anything, so it wants to conduct. So this would be an N-type material. Uh, here, though, we have boron, uh, which has an absence of an electron, uh, so electrons are going to want to move into that place, so this would be a P-type material. So in summary, P-type materials have excess holes, or the absence of electrons. N-type has excess electrons. I know I'm probably giving you a headache right now, but don't worry about it. Um, there's so much material that we're not covering here uh, that would maybe clarify things. So do some additional research and reading on your own, and, and hopefully it'll, it'll come clearer as we go. So when we do dope semiconductors, for example, silicon, uh, one that causes excess holes, making a P-type material, is called an acceptor donor. Acceptor donors means holes or an accepting, acceptor doping, it gives you holes. A donor <laughs> uh, dopant uh, is one that gives you excess electrons, creating N-type material. So a donor gives excess electrons. So let me, let me just say that again. Acceptor-type doping material holes. Donor gives you excess electrons. And so here again is uh, doping uh, they're um, adding uh, just a small amount of, in this case, I think it's indium. Uh, notice there's not an electron there. So this is going to be uh, with holes, uh, and that's going to promote. So this is going to P-type semiconductor material. That galena crystal with that copper wire on it created a diode. And diodes are the most basic form of semiconductors, and solid-state diodes uh, this is how you would uh, find them in a package uh, at the old Radio Shack store or now DigiKey or someplace. Uh, this is a, a probably a power uh, silicon diode. Uh, note the band here at the end. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. So there are eight types of diodes discussed in the book. And this is the, the first of the, the eight. These are called junction diodes. You have a junction of P-type material that is right up against N-type material. 
So here's the P-type material, and it really is physically right up against the N-type material, but the two, because of their atomic nature, have a, a depletion region in the middle. And this depletion region has to be overcome. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, these are the most common kinds of, of diodes. Uh, schematically, this is how you would draw it. The P-type material on this side, the N-type material uh, where the cathode is. So the P-type material is the anode, uh, N-type material is the cathode, or that pictorial that we saw before with the stripe, uh, this is showing you where the cathode is. And before this diode will conduct, you actually have to apply a, a small voltage across it to overcome that region, that depletion region in the middle. And so that's why diodes uh, will typically have, a, a, a silicon diodes, a 0.6 to 0.7 volt uh, reading across a good working diode. Uh, because that, once you've overcome that depletion region, then that is the constant voltage drop across a, a silicon diode here. Uh, and uh, if you actually connect up the voltage in reverse polarity, you will cause the depletion region uh, in a junction diode to get larger. This has some interesting impacts, and we'll talk more about that in another kind of diode uh, that we'll be talking about. So silicon diodes, uh, when they're forward biased, have about a 0.6 or 0.7 volt uh, voltage drop across them. Germanium diodes, uh, about 0.2 volts. And here's a, a nice animation that shows... Yes, go ahead. I want to just ask one quick question on that diode. Was that two... Two tenths volt. Well, does that make it a better detector, like in the crystal radio? One? It might. It might be more sensitive. Yes, indeed, absolutely. And you're going to see that here in just a second. <laughs> so uh, here is a uh, general purpose diode. Here, here's the depletion region, and that depletion region uh, shrinks and shrinks and shrinks uh, as higher voltage is applied to the diode. Diodes will have ratings, so you'll be able to determine, is this diode going to work in my circuit or not? One of those ratings is peak inverse voltage, uh, 50 volts, 100 volts, 300 volts, 1,000 volts. Um, if you're going to get diodes for a power supply, for example, uh, if it's going to be a 24-volt AC uh, transformer that you're feeding into it, you want to make sure that the peak inverse voltage, if you're going to make it into DC, uh, is high enough so that um, it, it won't break down. If you go uh, with a higher voltage than the peak inverse voltage, uh, you'll destroy the diode. The maximum current carrying capability of the diode, the uh, one amp, two amp, five amps. Diodes tend to fail due to high temperatures. That's a, a general saying, but it, it's true. So P-type and N-type material directly next to each other, that's a junction diode. The second type of diode that we'd like to talk about tonight, and this is the schematic diagram for it, is a Schottky diode. I kind of think this looks like an S, so that Schottky. Um, the P-type material isn't there. You just have the N-type material, uh, and the P-type material is replaced by a metal contact. It's used in power circuits. Uh, it could be silicon, uh, P-type material, and it has a lower voltage drop, in this case, 0.2 volts. That's a Schottky diode. A point contact diode typically is made, uh, at least this one is germanium. And look at this pictorial. Doesn't it look a lot like this? Here's that wire going down to the semiconductor material. If you look inside the glass envelope of this diode, you see there's a little wire, and it's going up to a, a pellet of N-type germanium. This is a 1N34 diode. They're the most common detector diodes used for radios, for demodulating AM. So yes, indeed, the germanium is a really good signal detector diode. Uh, and this is the third uh, kind of diode, a point contact diode. And, and you can buy these, and if you, you know, look with a magnifying glass, you'll see exactly this, because they're clear. Hot carrier diodes is a special type of Schottky diode. Um, there's no P-type material. 
at the junction it adds a metal dot uh, so that it's not just a wire connecting to it. Uh, it has a very low voltage drop and very fast switching. Hot carrier diodes are good for UHF and VHF mixers or detectors. So those are hot carrier diodes, VHF, UHF mixers or detectors. The fifth diode, you know, we were just covering this so fast, and it, there's a lot more information that you need to know, but okay, this is all we're going to tell you tonight. <laughs> Current flows in the reverse direction. You reverse bias a Zener diode, and when you do that, there's a region of this specially designed diode that the voltage stays constant up until the point when it finally breaks down. This constant voltage is good because it's a reference. And so Zener diodes uh, are used as voltage references, um, either directly in a circuit that you're powering or as the reference for a voltage regulator IC uh, or pass transistor. So Zener diodes are used for voltage regulation because of, the, of their constant voltage drop. And you buy these uh, in uh, 9 volt or 12 volt or 25 volt flavors uh, because that's where their constant voltage is, this Zener breakdown region right here. Remember I said there was kind of an interesting case when you could vary that depletion region uh, if you reversed bias the diode. Uh, more reverse bias meant a larger depletion region. Well, that depletion region actually has capacitance. And so you can make tuning diodes or varactor diodes using the depletion region characteristics. The depletion region capacitance, which will change with the bias voltage, and you can then tune a radio electronically. So you might remember TV tuners that said, oh, we have varactor diode tuning. This is what they were talking about. They didn't use physical capacitors anymore, or variable capacitors anymore. They used diodes serving as variable capacitors. That's a varactor diode. You've probably heard about pin diodes uh, for RF switching in ham radio transmitters and linear amplifiers. Pin diodes add a third layer to the PN junction. So here's our P material, here's our N type material, and non doped or intrinsic silicon, probably, here in the middle. What this does. Uh, these are used for RF attenuators and switches. Um, this will conduct DC and radio frequency energy um, when it is forward biased. Why would you want to do that? Well, for transmit and receive switching uh, in a transceiver uh, or for high power uh, switching in a linear amplifier, Sometimes you can use relays, and they go click, clack, click, clack, depending on where you're transmitting or receiving. But if you wanted to send break-in Morse code, where you can listen in between the dits and the das, relays aren't fast enough to do that. Pin diodes are. They're very fast. So when you add, send forward uh, bias to it, it'll conduct RF. When you re take it away, it will not. So, and one of the reasons it does that is because a, a pin diode has very low what they call junction capacitance. Between the N material and the P-type material, there's not a lot of capacitive coupling between there. So RF, um, which is, you know, a high frequency AC, is blocked unless DC is allowed to flow. And this is how you do it. Um, you send RF in through a capacitor. You have your DC switching here, so this is a bias source of some type, going through a radio frequency choke. So the RF won't come out this way, it's blocked by the choke. DC causes the pin diode to conduct, and the RF will then follow through uh, and go on out through. So when there's forward bias on the pin diode, RF can come through. When that's taken away, it blocks RF. And so with a matrix of pin diodes, you can do transmit and receive switching uh, in a transceiver. It's completely silent, 
no click clacks of a relay, and it's very, very fast. Question, Gary. Yes. Okay, the image you had the pin dial, the previous slide, why was the positive negative greater than the negative material? Uh, well, it, th bad drawing. <laughs> it should be about the same. It, it, I don't think it makes any difference. See, okay. here, here they're about the same. And you can follow back to the original wiki uh, article on uh, pin diodes to see where I got that from. The final diode type that we want to learn about tonight, number eight of eight, uh, is the light emitting diode. And we've talked about these before. Uh, an LED emits photons when it's forward biased. There's always a current limiting resistor uh, that has to be used uh, because without this, uh, if you apply voltage directly across the diode, it'll probably go pretty quick and it'll, it'll burn itself out. There, it's current limited, uh, so you have to use a resistor. Uh, and this will set the brightness of the LED as well. So this might be 100 ohms, but if you want it dimmer, you might make it 200 ohms. Um, so current limiting for an LED. And of course, you've all seen LEDs, and they can be in various colors uh, and uh, um, various shapes, etc. So what's ahead in the semiconductor industry? Um, a lot of new advancements, and in fact, um, you know, we prepared this uh, presentation a couple years ago. A lot of these have really come true. Um, gallium or gallium arsenide um, is a, a material, a uh, semiconductor compound used in some diodes and field effect transistors. Uh, what makes them uh, so useful is they're useful at ultra high radio frequencies and in fast switching applications. Uh, and uh, they generate less noise than silicon, uh, and so for weak signal amplification. Notice what it looks like. It's got that, you know, the bright, shiny matrix again. And it's a semiconductor material with, with extraordinary properties because electrons travel six times faster in gallium arsenide than in silicon, so faster transistor operations. The drawback was that one single wafer could cost up to $5,000, whereas a same size wafer of silicon costs $5. But the thought was that solar panels with this material could produce much, much more power than silicon panels. And I saw advertised just in the last month a gallium arsenide solar panel, which did have much, much higher output. Now, I don't know what the price of it was, uh, but th that's kind of cool. And the thing that makes it cool, one of the things, is, is electron mobility. It's the speed with which electrons move through a semiconductor in the presence of, of an electric field. So here's, you know, lowly silicon uh, in, in a couple of uh, instances. Um, here's germanium, but here's the gallium arsenide uh, out here. So uh, that's, that's one of the reasons. There's also a cousin, gallium nitride. Uh, they have a tenth of the resistance of silicon. They have higher energy efficiency, faster switching, and these are used primarily in monolithic microwave ICs, MMICs, also known as MIMICs. And, and this is what a packaged MIMIC looks like. Um, they're used for RF amplifiers on a chip or a block. They have standard gain, um, which you can adjust by uh, adding attenuators to the input. They have standard input and output impedances. They have controlled gain and very low noise. And to power these guys, there's no power input. What you do is you find the output point and you use an RF choke uh, and you feed DC in through the choke and into the output of the device, and that's how you power up the device. So uh, power coming in through the output and ground. Those are the, the, the two power connections uh, for a Mimic. You have probably a few hundred of these Mimic devices in your pocket right now, in your cell phone. These are the building blocks uh, of a lot of modern-day um, radio equipment. And one of the things that makes that possible is microstrip construction. Mimics can sit on top of a PC board, uh, and if the PC board is made with a, a ground plane uh, on one side and uh, wiring here, uh, microstrip construction um, has a constant impedance uh, and low noise. Uh, 
So this is a very good construction technique to use with mimics. So now I want to go back. Remember we talked about transistors and um, uh, the, the, the first kind of things that uh, um, came into play were the germanium transistors and then the silicon transistors. Well, the first type of transistors were bipolar transistors. And so um, here we have a, a schematic diagram of a, a common bipolar transistor. Uh, bipolar transistors, as you might remember from the technician class and general class, have a base, a collector, and emitter lead. Um, this is what we would call a common emitter configuration. The emitter of the transistor is connected to ground. That's what it means, common emitter. Um, and uh, bipolar transistors are what we say are current driven. A small change in current here from the base emitter junction will create a large change in current from the collector to emitter junction. So a uh, small current here gives you a big current here, which gives you a small voltage in, larger voltage out. Remember, transistors can be used for gain or amplification and can also be used as electronic switches. And it's proportional, so that's why... Yes. And, and the ratio, the ratio of a base current change to collector current change is known as a transistor's beta in the common emitter configuration. It's, a, it's one, one of the, what they call a hybrid a parameter. Um, so if you see HFE, this is a hybrid parameter, forward gain, common emitter configuration. Uh, and so the ratio of collector current to base current is the transistor's beta, or gain. And this can be characterized as DC, or DC currents, or it can be characterized with AC currents, so the DC beta or the AC beta. Um, and the, the collector current uh, is the beta times the base current in a common emitter configuration. So here's that transistor again. Here the emitter is being connected directly to ground. Uh, input is coming in on the base, the output going from the collector. So this is beta or um, HFE. Transistors also can be connected as common base uh, configurations. So that's what you see here, where the input comes in on the emitter and the output goes out on the collector. In this case, the gain or the hybrid parameter is called alpha. And it's usually actually in this case less than one uh, because um, the current that flows through the emitter and base um, and the current that flows from the collector to the emitter, uh, it, it, it's always going to be less than one in, in this ratio. But it's useful. Uh, to know the characteristic uh, of the transistor. So you can, for example, you want to match transistors to make sure that their beta or their alpha, depending on the circuit configuration, is the same. Will the transistor work uh, in that circuit? Um, may uh, be determined by uh, these characteristics. Another characteristic that will determine whether the transistor will work is its cutoff frequency. How, what operating frequency can it operate at before the gain drops 3 dB or voltage 0 0.707. So that's the beta cutoff frequency in a, in a common emitter configuration. Uh, another in the common base, they have the alpha cutoff frequency. So alpha and beta cutoff frequencies are generally nearly equal, um, but uh, that's a characteristic of the transistor. You pay more for higher frequency transistors. So uh, a transistor designed for audio work is going to be one thing. A transistor designed for radio frequency use is going to be something completely different. And transistor biasing uh, in a common emitter circuit, the voltage between the base and the emitter is going to be, for a silicon transistor, about 0.6 or 0.7 volts. Uh, whereas for a germanium transistor, it would be about 0.2 volts. And that's, for troubleshooting in a circuit, that's a quick and dirty way of taking a DC multimeter and going through, um, is the base emitter junction, is it 0.6? Okay, that's probably good. Let's check the next one, uh, next one, next one. And when you find one that, oh, that's it's reading 5 volts. 
across the transistor, you know that transistor is probably open. Uh, so that's, that's for troubleshooting. Field effect transistors are another kind of uh, common transistors. Whereas the, the bipolar transistors are current uh, devices or low impedance devices, field effect transistors we say are high impedance devices. They're driven more by voltage than current. And you might remember they have a, a source, a gate, and a drain. Uh, and field effect transistors are used uh, a lot in low noise UHF or above preamplifiers. A surface mount device field effect transistors are, are used here in this uh, receive preamplifier. Typically they have about a 2 dB noise figure. That's, that's pretty common. Uh, and so that adds about 2 dB of noise uh, to the signal that is being amplified uh, in the, the preamplifier here. And on a schematic diagram, this is the, the most basic kind of field effect transistor called a junction FET. The arrow on these always points toward the n-type material. So this is what is known as an n-channel junction FET. Here notice the arrow is pointing away, so this is a p-channel junction uh, FET, gate, source, and drain. And this is a, a pictorial of, of how they're assembled uh, with n-type and p-type material. There, I don't want to confuse you, but there are two different kinds of field effect transistors. An enhancement mode FET the device is normally off. There's no current flow between the drain and the source unless you get a bias the gate toward uh, the drain voltage. So if the drain here is at some positive voltage, the minute you start applying positive voltage to this enhancement mode, then current will start to flow. Otherwise, if you don't have any bias, there's no current flow. That's enhancement mode. Uh, and MOS in this case is metal oxide silicon, which is a special family of FET. Depletion mode FETs work the opposite. And they're more like tubes, actually. The device is normally on. Normally there will be current flow from the source to the drain unless the gate is biased to blow a threshold voltage. And when that happens, current flow shuts off. So you need to know enhancement mode or depletion mode for field effect transistors. And there is a schematic diagram difference uh, down below. Uh, this is a depletion mode, uh, whereas over here with the, see the separations? This is an enhancement mode. And notice that this has not just one gate, but two gates. So this is a dual gate field effect transistor, gate one and gate two two inputs to it, and, okay, the arrow is pointing toward the line, so that means this is an N-channel, two-gate MOSFET. Over here, this is also uh, an N-channel, two-gate MOSFET, the arrow is pointed toward the, the line, but this is an enhancement type. The arrow points toward the N-type material. And with MOSFETs, metal oxide silicon field effect transistors, Static is a problem. Uh, static voltages can punch through uh, from the gate to the drain and source and cause the FET to fail. That's why a lot of MOSFETs have back-to-back -back Zener diodes built into them. And what happens here is if a static uh, comes in, it'll be clamped by these Zener diodes. Let's say these are one volt Zener diodes, so that it'll be clamped down to no more than two volts and uh, won't damage the field effect transistor. Oh, we covered so much material in such a short period of time. But anyway, let's see how we do with some questions. So go ahead and unmute, uh, and you can open up their, uh, their audio, if you would. Uh, and let's see what they say to, what is microstrip? <laughs> What is microstrip? Delta. Delta is correct. Precision printed circuit conductors 
above a ground plane that provide constant impedance interconnects at up to microwave frequencies used for mimics and other devices. So in what application is gallium arsenide used as a semiconductor material? Charlie. Alpha. Charlie. It's going to be Charlie because we're talking about high frequency devices. They're very, very fast. They're not necessarily high current, but they are very high frequency. So in this case, in microwave circuits. Oh, yes, I can do that. Let me spotlight. You can read it a little easier. There we go. Thank you. So which of the following semiconductor materials contains excess free electrons? Alpha. Alpha. Yep, n-type material. And why does a p-n junction diode not conduct current when reversed biased? Charlie. Charlie. Holes in p-type material and electrons in n-type material are separated by the applied voltage, widening the depletion region. And what is the name given to an impurity atom that adds holes to a semiconductor crystal structure? Charlie. Charlie. That's an acceptor. And how does DC input impedance at the gate of a field effect transistor compare with the DC input impedance of a bipolar transistor? Charlie. Charlie. FETs are high impedance devices, whereas bipolar are low impedance devices. And what is the beta of a bipolar junction transistor? Bravo. Do we see that? It's the yeah. change in collector current with respect to the base current. And which of the following indicates that a silicon NPN junction transistor is biased on? Delta. Delta. The base emitter voltage Delta. has got to be approximately 0.6. To 0.7 volts. And what term indicates the frequency at which ground based, grounded base current gain of a transistor? Let's start again. What term indicates the frequency at which the grounded base current gain of a transistor has decreased to 0.7 of the gain obtained at 1 kilohertz? E, delta? Yes, delta. That is the alpha cutoff frequency. And what is a depletion mode FET? Alpha. It is alpha. It's an, an FET that exhibits a current flow between the source and drain when no gate voltage is applied. All right. In this figure, what is the schematic symbol for an N-channel Dual gate MOSFET. Bravo. 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 So, Agreed. so Bravo is this guy right here, number four. So we're looking for a dual gate MOSFET, uh, N channel. There's gate two, gate one, N channel. You are correct. And in this figure, what is the schematic symbol for a P channel junction FET? Alpha. Alpha. It's number one on the diagram up there, which is alpha in the answer sheet. Notice that the arrow is pointed away from the, the channel. That makes it's P channel. So why do many MOSFET devices have internally connected Zener diodes on the gates? Delta. Delta. Yep, to reduce static damage. And what is the most useful characteristic of a Zener diode? Bravo. Bravo. Yep, constant voltage drop. And what is an important characteristic of a Schottky diode as compared to an ordinary silicon diode when used as a power supply rectifier? Delta. Delta. It's got a, a voltage drop of only 0.2 volts as opposed to 0.6 or 0.7, so less forward voltage drop. Uh, and a lot of the uh, um, automatic DC switching, if you've got a, one for a power supply and one for a battery, they use Schottky diodes uh, to do that switching for you. So what type of bias is required for an LED to emit light? Uh, forward bias. 
and what type of semiconductor device is designed for use as a voltage controlled capacitor? Alpha. Alpha. That's a varactor. And what characteristic of a pin diode makes it useful as an RF switch? Delta. 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 Yeah, it's, it, when it's uh, not biased forward, it's got a very low capacitance, very low coupling across. So, yep. And what is the failure mechanism when a junction diode fails due to excessive current? Bravo. It's always heat, Bravo. excessive Bravo. junction temperature. Yep. <laughs> And which of the following is a shot key barrier diode? Alpha. It's a metal to semiconductor junction. They replace one of the, the semiconductor materials. And what is a common use for point contact diodes? That's that 1N34. That's an RF detector, Charlie. All right, in this pictorial, what is the schematic symbol for a light-emitting diode? Bravo. Bravo. That's number five, or bravo, on the answer sheet. And what is used to control the attenuation of RF signals by a pin diode? Alpha. Forward DC bias current. I didn't point out that you can have it biased on, and it'll pass RF, but if you only bias it somewhat, uh, it'll actually act as an attenuator and control the output uh, level. So why is gallium arsenide useful for semiconductor devices operating at UHF on higher frequencies? Alpha. alpha. It's not alpha. It's not higher noise Beta. figures. Bravo. Yeah, it's higher alpha. electron Bravo. mobility, like I showed you on that chart. Uh, things move faster through it. And which of the following materials is likely to provide the highest frequency of operation when used in mimics? Delta. Delta. It's going to be Delta. one of the galliums, so in this case, gallium nitride. Yeah. And which is the most common input and output impedance of circuits that use mimics? Alpha. 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 It is alpha. I didn't mention it, but 50 ohms. <laughs> think of your transmitter. It's got a 50 ohm output. 50 ohm in and out of a mimic is standard. So which of the following noise figure values is typical of a low noise UHF preamp? Alpha. 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 2 dB. And what characteristics of the mimic make it a popular choice for VHF through microwave? Delta. Delta. Control Delta. gain, low noise, constant input and output impedance, yep. And what type of transmission line is used for connections to mimics? Delta. Delta. That's Delta. that microstrip construction. And how is power supplied to the most common type of mimic? Alpha. Alpha. Yep, through a resistor or RF choke connected to the amplifier output lead. Very good. All right. We're moving on to optoelectronics. Again, this could be a college uh, long, uh, semester long uh, college course, but <laughs> we're going to talk about it just for a few minutes here. And then after this section, we'll take a break. So, this fascinated me. I didn't know this. Light inventing diodes were invented in 1927. Who knew? I think it was by a Russian. Uh, the first practical use, though, was in 1962. And so, light emitting diodes are forward biased in order to give light. And again, we saw the, the schematic diagram uh, of a light emitting diode. And this is the construction. Uh, and again, you always want to have a current limiting resistor. And an LED will emit light when it's forward biased. One other thing I read, which I didn't know, is all diodes emit light uh, when um, uh, they're forward biased. Not just uh, LEDs, but they're in a, in a you know, a, case so you can't see it um why are yeah. we going yeah why are we go ahead the leds if you change the voltage to them is that is that not what changes the color of them no uh they have to be they're made specifically for color uh the color that they're going to be using uh and um uh, they, you may have multiple leds uh, in one package and so you're you uh, turn one on or, or then the other etc would you push, oh, I guess, hmm, I'm trying to figure out why this is uh, changing here. I don't know. Okay. All right. Anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> uh, 
So this is in here. This is actually an obsolete device. You won't find too many of these charge coupled devices uh, used in digital imaging. Um, and um, I just want to look over here. Why is that? Okay, I'm going to turn you off. What you... It's interesting. Okay. Never mind. We're good. Um, what a CCD device does is it samples uh, light, uh, an analog signal, and passes it in stages from the input to the output of the device. So it kind of scans across the material and um, the data comes out of, of pins on the devices. And you can you know, go to Banggood or some of the other AliExpress or whatever. You can buy a charge coupled device and a lens in a package like this. Uh, very uh, inexpensive, uh, very uh, uh, practical um, and uh, make your own camera system. Liquid crystal displays uh, have been around forever. In fact, I'm wearing one right now on my wrist. It kind of looks like this. Um, it's a device that where it turns opaque when voltage is applied uh, and it uses using polarizing uh, uh, circuits in here. Sometimes though, if you're wearing polarized sunglasses, it's very hard to read these displays. So liquid crystal displays turn opaque uh, when voltage is applied. Electric eyes are photoresistors or photocells, and the resistance changes with the illumination level. It uses a property called photoconductivity. More light equals more conductive. And I just want to emphasize this because people get it backwards. I get it backwards. Conductivity versus resistance. Conductivity uh, is, is talking about how conductive or how, how fast you can get the current to flow through the material. Resistance is how can you block the material. So when conductivity goes up, resistance goes down. When resistance goes up, conductivity goes down. So they're, they're the inverse of each other. So I need to tell you a little story about the first time I ever saw a photo cell. It was back at the Montgomery Ward store in Saginaw, Michigan. This wasn't it. It, it was actually an older store than this. I think it was at Christmas time, uh, and they had the main door to the store hooked up to an electric eye. It probably was using tube type uh, amplifiers and uh, a relay. It was the most fascinating thing. You walk up, and all of a sudden, the door would open by itself. That was from the future. <laughs> How far we have come. But it goes back. It was using a photocell. When light would be on it, it would be very conductive, uh, and so it would keep the door closed. But if you broke the, the beam, then uh, its conductivity would go down. Conductivity would go down, resistance would go up, and the door would open. That's how the circuit works. So, and also, uh, photoconductive materials are, have been used for a long time in like light meters. Anybody remember light meters? Uh, selenium photocells were the, the common things uh, for those. It's a crystalline semiconductor. Note, it kind of looks kind of like uh, the shiny stuff we've been looking at. Also, another uh, opto uh, device in electronics is uh, an opto coupler, also known as an opto isolator. Uh, and it's a chip that may just have four leads like this. And on one side, it's a light emitting diode in the package. You don't see the light. And on the other side is a phototransistor, where the, the photons replace the base on the transistor. And what happens is it isolates uh, at this point. So all of the circuit that's on this side is electrically isolated from all of the circuit that's on this side. Uh, so uh, it's an LED coupled with a phototransistor and it provides electrical isolation between circuits. And that comes into play here, for example. This is a, a switching power supply. I think it's a check uh, power supply. Um, connected up to the mains voltage there, 230 volts AC which is coming into the switching power supply and it's trying to get 12 volts at 5 amps out. It's using a high frequency 100 kilohertz 
a transformer here, so there's isolation here, but it's got to provide feedback to regulate the voltage, and the feedback goes through an optotransistor. Uh, and so uh, this isolates this high voltage side uh, of the power supply, the switching power supply, with the low voltage side. That's what an opto isolator does. It provides electrical isolation. Solar panels uses the photovoltaic effect to convert light to electrical energy. Uh, and silicon um, solar cells are the most common right now. And each panel consists of multiple silicon solar cells connected in series and parallel. Solar cell efficiency is said to be the relative fraction of light that is converted to current. So if you had 100% of light and, and it's all converted to current, well, then you have 100% efficiency. But what if your solar cell is dirty? Well, then maybe you've got 100% light, but only 50% is getting through. So that is said to be much less efficient, obviously. Each solar cell uh, outputs roughly 0.5 volts DC. And what happens in the solar cells uh, in the silicon, the electrons are shifted into a higher state by the photons coming from the sun. <laughs> and that's what we talk about with solar cells. Okay, there's so much more. Um, optical shaft encoders, you may find these on your ham radio transceiver in the big knob. The variable frequency oscillator used to be controlled by you know changing the capacitance of a variable capacitor. Well nowadays you're actually just generating a digital word with a rotary encoder. And that digital word uh, is read by some photo cells here and sent off to a microcomputer to tell you, okay, I'm tuning up or I'm tuning down. Uh, that's an optical shaft encoder, also known as a rotary encoder. And you may find a practical use for these solid state relays. Uh, you can replace sometimes one for one mechanical relays. Uh, all of the switching electronics is, is built into the device, uh, and these are commonly used to interface older linear amplifiers uh, to your radio's push to talk output because uh, sometimes the older amplifiers, I know some of them actually switch to 120 volts AC. Uh, well, your radio's PTT probably can't handle that, but with one of these in between, an MFJ and, and other cell uh, devices with these in, um, you can then uh, switch uh, older, trans uh, trans older amplifiers with modern transceivers. Okay, let's answer some questions and take a break. What absorbs the energy from light falling on a photovoltaic cell? Charlie. The electrons are moved up to a higher energy state. Yeah. And what happens to the conductivity of a photoconductive material when light shines on it? Alpha. Conductivity increases. And what is the most common configuration of an optoisolator or optocoupler? Alpha. No. Not alpha. No, I did delta. delta. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's an LED and a phototransistor, maybe in one package. And what is the photovoltaic effect? Bravo. It's the conversion of light to electrical energy. And which describes an optical shaft encoder? Alpha. Notice the pattern wheel. Uh, it's a device that detects rotation uh, of a control by interrupting a light source with a patterned wheel. And the pattern tells uh, the uh, electronics which way you're turning it. And which of these materials is most commonly used to create photoconductive devices? Alpha. Alpha. You have Alpha. to have a crystalline semiconductor. And what is a solid state relay? Bravo. Yep, it's a device that uses semiconductors to implement the functions of an electromechanical relay. And why are optoisolators often used in conjunction with solid state circuits? Sure. When switching 120 volts AC, 
it has to be Charlie. Opto-isolators, they provide a high degree of electrical isolation between a control circuit and the circuit being switched. So switching power supplies, I'll, I'll use this. And what is the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell? Delta. It's the relative fraction of light that is converted to current, by definition. And what is the most common type of photovoltaic cell? Bravo. Silicon. And what is the approximate open circuit voltage produced by a fully illuminated silicon volt photovoltaic cell? Bravo. Half a volt. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the midpoint, uh, or actually two-thirds point uh, in this class. Let's go ahead and take five minutes uh, and... Uh, Get up and move around, stretch, and uh, we will see you back here in five.
Hey, we're back. <laughs> so we're going into section 5.3, which is digital logic. I took multiple college classes on digital logic. Um, and um, But okay, we're going to try to cover it all in less than an hour here. Uh, the thing is, uh, you know, why should we learn about digital logic anymore? We can't hardly buy digital chips anymore. Well, amateur radio equipment, a lot of it uh, is of various different vintages. I mean, we still have tube type equipment uh, that is operating uh, successfully. And so um, there is equipment of an age that used a lot of digital logic gates and chips inside. And so it's worthwhile knowing at least some of the general theory uh, behind uh, digital uh, logic and, and uh, those kind of things. Uh, so that's why we're talking about it tonight. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and uh, the difference between analog signals, uh, those are, are signals that you know have continuous range, uh, and uh, it could be you know high uh, positive voltage or negative voltage or somewhere in between. Uh, digital signals have two states: on or off. One or zero. Um, all of these different things can be. Everything is represented in digital logic, uh, in in either on or off, one or zero. Uh, only one of the two specific states. And so you'd think, well, this is a new innovation, relatively new. Nope. 1847. George Boole. Uh, actually wrote, wrote papers on this, and, and we now call it Boolean algebra. Uh, it's algebra dealing with two states, uh, false or true, and it's fundamental to digital electronics, but it's you know all the way back <laughs> to 1847. And he came up with all sorts of different mathematical uh, principles uh, in Boolean math, the identity, the complementary, the communicative, the distributive, the associative, um, all of these things. Uh, we're not going to go into any of this, but it is fascinating, and this is where you can spend your time uh, in those college-level classes. Something you need to know about, are you talking about positive or negative logic? Huh? <laughs> positive logic defines a high voltage as a 1. Whereas negative logic defines a low voltage, a low voltage as a one. So generally we're going to be talking about positive logic uh, in anything that we're going to talk about tonight. But just know that um, a positive OR gate is the same as a negative AND gate. Uh, and, and so on and so forth here. I don't want to blow your mind about it, but um, it is sometimes true that digital designers would switch between positive logic and negative logic uh, because they only had AND chips or they only had OR chips. <laughs> so uh, uh, it got to be a nightmare, uh, really, but uh, hopefully that won't be visited on you. So I, I like this uh, light bulb uh, analogy here. This is an OR gate. And by this we mean we have two inputs, an A input and a B input, and an output, which they call Q. And if A is connected, or if B is connected, then Q will be true or be on. Either, or, or both, in this case, an OR gate. So uh, A or B or both will give you an output Q. Whereas an AND gate, that was an OR gate, this is an AND gate, you have to have A and B in order to get an output true. So uh, this is, these are very basic gates uh, with switches um, and a light bulb uh, on the output. We, when we say ones and zeros for transistor-transistor logic chips, which were the most common, well, high voltage is 5 volts, low voltage is 0 volts, but they weren't that precise. Any, anywhere down in here was considered a low. Anywhere up here is okay uh, as a high for input signals, and the output signal levels were, were even a little bit smaller. This area right in here, see this area? Or this area right in here? Those were known as the indeterminate regions. And you never wanted to have your input or your output 
be anywhere in the indeterminate region because the gates that would follow wouldn't know what to do with that. Is that a high or is that a low? Huh? I don't know. <laughs> the most basic kind of logic gate can be done with even just diodes. Five volts in here on the A will give you five volts out here. Or five volts in through the B will give you five volts out here. So diode logic. Is, is very basic. No matter what kind of logic you're using, whether it be switches, whether it be diodes, or whether it be gates, they'll all have truth tables. And so here's the truth table for an AND gate. You have to have A and B in order to get an output. Or an OR gate, you can have A or B or both and get an output. There are NAND gates which is an AND gate with an inverter on the output. Or you can have NOR gates, or exclusive OR, or exclusive NOR. These are the various chip types uh, that would be in common usage. So a NOT gate is an inverter. And uh, schematically it's drawn like this. You see the little circle on the output? That means inversion. And so if you have a A is 1, then Q will be 0. If A is 0, then Q will be 1. And this is the, the truth table for a NOT gate or an inverter. An OR gate, here's the truth table. Uh, so it's A or B or both will give you a high output Q. Here's the truth table. An AND gate. And by the way, if you look at these chips, notice the straight line here. Let me go back. Notice the curved line here. For me, see how the, the O is curved? So that tells me this is an OR gate because it's the, it's the curve from the O in OR, whereas an AND gate has a straight line. So here's that straight line. So this is an AND gate. So pictorially or schematically, this is, this is how I differentiate. And here is the truth table for an AND gate. So we looked at an OR gate before. An exclusive OR gate is one where A or B, but not both. So here's A is 1, you get a 1 output. B is 1, you get a 1 output. But if A and B are 1s, you do not get an output. That's the exclusivity part. And that's where this additional line comes in here. That's an exclusive OR gate. And so here are some logic gate symbols. The OR gate, remember, with the curve. The AND gate with the straight line. The NOT gate, or the inverter, it's got the dot. That means inversion. Exclusive OR has got uh, an extra line here. So it's A or B, but not both. A NOR gate uh, is an OR gate with an inverter on the output. And a NAND gate is an AND gate with an inverter on the output. So you can puzzle these through. Uh, thankfully, you don't have to do a lot of uh, work with the logic gates anymore. Um, but this is something that we'll see some questions here on the test. So I mentioned that diode logic was the, the probably the simplest uh, b besides switches. Um, and diode transistor logic it was uh, something that they first put into integrated circuits. And they had chips uh, with DTL logic. That was made pretty obsolete uh, pretty quickly. And it later moved to TTL, transistor transistor logic, where you had transistors on the input and you had transistors on the output. Now notice this transistor here will pull this line down or it, when it conducts, or when it opens up, it'll let it float up to whatever the VCC voltage is uh, through this resistor. So that's how transistor-transistor logic chips worked. Um, this resistor, if it was external to the device, would be known as a pull-up resistor, which would help the gate uh, to get up to the, the whatever the, the voltage was that you wanted it to. You can also have pull-down resistors that would uh, pull a gate input uh, down to ground when it wasn't being actively pulled up. Um, it holds a voltage constant uh, when the gate is at a high impedance. 
and some TTL output uh, transistor uh, devices had what they called totem pole outputs, which were active transistors that would either pull it high or active transistors that would pull it low, so you didn't have any need uh, for uh, pull uh, up or pull down resistors, and it would allow you to drive more chips, because a lot of times the output of a chip would be connected to six other chips that would do logic functions based on the output, uh, and uh, the more chips you could drive from one transistor, the better. But when you're driving those chips, the voltages would change, and you always had to make sure that you were outside of that uncertain region. Um, you needed to, you know, keep it um, uh, between two and five volts or zero and 0.8 volts uh, to make sure that the the gates uh, would read things properly. So after TTL came CMOS. And uh, this is the current state of the art as far as logic chips. If you're going to find logic chips out there, they're likely to be CMOS. They're complementary metal oxide semiconductors. I'm going to go ahead and hit spotlight, maybe make it easier for you to see. Um, again, here we have the A input and the B input uh, and the output uh, connected here. These MOSFETs use much less power uh, than TTL. Um, and... Uh, they actually have greater noise margins than TTL because their switching threshold is approximately that of half of whatever the supply voltage is. So that's CMOS logic chips. That's the current state of chips. There are combinations of bipolar and CMOS. Uh, here's a, a pictorial where you have a field effect transistors on the inputs and bipolar transistors in a totem pole uh, on the output, uh, they have high impedance inputs and low impedance outputs uh, because field effect transistors are high impedance devices, bipolar transistors are low impedance devices. There are also chips that use something called tri-state logic. And by this, we're not talking about New York, Connecticut, New Jersey. No, we're talking about this. There's a C input, sometimes called the clock input, um, and um, the output state uh, F can be high or can be low or it can be nothing. <laughs> it can be high impedance, so they, they, they call it Z. Uh, and this C input or clocking input to the chip uh, allows uh, you to actually take the chip off uh, of the bus, off of uh, where it's driving other chips. Um, Tri-state logic um, has high, low, or open logic states. The chip select, or C input or output, um, they can connect, be connected to a common bus. Uh, that's tri-state logic. Going so fast on this. Programmable logic devices uh, originally, these devices had uh, little fuses built into them, uh, and you could program the gates in a specified pattern to do a specified job of work. And you do that by actually blowing certain of the fuses uh, in the programmable logic device. You could only do that once, uh, and then uh, if you wanted to make changes later on, you had to buy a whole new chip and start that uh, process over again. This has pretty much been superseded now by something called Field Programmable Gate Arrays. Uh, this is a device that can be reconfigured by software. On a single chip like this, you can have just the thousands and thousands of gates uh, represented. And many software-defined radios use Field Programmable Gate Arrays uh, to, uh, to contain much of their software uh, and switching. Uh, it's very fast. Uh, because everything is happening at the chip level. Uh, so my Flex uh, 6600, for example, has a bunch of these. Uh, and when you uh, update the radio software, it is reconfiguring the field programmable gate arrays to do the job uh, that they want it to do. So we talked about single gates. Uh, single gates can be configured together to form something. In this case, it's called a flip-flop, also known as an RS flip-flop. Set, reset is what it stands for, and it's got two stable states. It move. It's a bi-stable circuit. Uh, so Q 
alternates from being high to low, and not Q alternates from being high to low. They're opposite of the other, obviously. And so this is known as a flip-flop. Well, this isn't so interesting, but Jack Kilby of Texas Instruments added an input, a clock input, uh, to enable uh, the thing to flip, flop, or latch. And this clock input uh, to the uh, RS or SR flip-flop made it very, very handy for a lot of different logic functions and counting. Uh, and so here is a, a JK flip-flop, and you see that the outputs alternate, but they only alternate when there's a clock input. If the clock input was uh, absent, then they would not alternate. And you can use a JK flip-flop for binary counting, because it'll divide the clock input by two at each one of these gates. So here, if we have a very you know fast pulse coming in, well, here it's been divided by two. That can be run into another JK flip-flop. It's divided by two again. That can be run into another JK flip-flop where it's divided by two again. That can be run into another and it's divided by two again. So a lot of frequency counters and, and other devices used uh, JK flip-flops uh, for binary counting. Multivibrators are kind of analogous. Uh, uh, they're, they're like free-running clocks. Uh, they generate uh, a Q output and an inversion of that, or the not Q output, uh, and it's always uh, going back and forth. It's the digital equivalent of an oscillator. Uh, it's generating a signal. And here's a, a representation uh, of uh, an, um, this is a A-stable multivibrator schematic, and here it is uh, with the LEDs. Uh, and the timing uh, is uh, controlled by the, the values of capacitance and resistance. So that was an A-stable. You can also have a mono-stable uh, multivibrator. It has only one stable state, but you can get it to produce an output pulse by flipping a, a switch on the input. Uh, and then it'll take the output low briefly and then come back up in a controlled manner. Well, why would you want this? Well, in digital circuits, mechanical switches um, don't actually make very well uh, all the time. So they can get dirty, uh, they can you know, be connected, then not connected, then connected again, and that's counted as three pulses. Well, you don't want that. You only want one pulse. So this is what is known as a debounce circuit. It debounces the mechanical switch so that every time you push the switch, no matter how dirty it is, you'll only get one output pulse. That's a monostable multivibrator. And here's a schematic diagram of that with the trigger input uh, and uh, the time constant output. Bistable uh, multivibrators have uh, two stable states. They're directly coupled together. We talked about those. Um, and a decade counter. This is a neat device. You can buy them on a chip. And it's an IC that counts pulses and it has one output for every 10 inputs. So you're counting by 10. Uh, so this is good for um, you know, using our you know, human numbering system, uh, base 10, that we use all the time. Uh, this is translating from binary to base 10. And uh, uh, 4017B, for example, is an integrated circuit that has 10 output pins, a clock enable, a set and reset, and it's used to count uh, binary uh, pulses uh, into a decade. Okay, that was a lot of material covered very shallowly. I apologize, but let's see if we can answer some questions here. So what is tri-state logic? George Washington Bridge. <laughs> we would hope. Alpha. It is alpha. They're logic devices with a low or zero, a high, one, and a high impedance output state. So which, is the which of the following is an advantage of bi-CMOS? Darling. Yep, it has the high input Darling. impedance of CMOS and the low output impedance of bipolar. 
And what is an advantage of CMOS over TTL devices? Delta. Much Delta. less power consumption. In TTL devices that had circuit boards filled with TTL chips, you had to really have a huge, beefy power supply to supply the current for all of those chips. So why do CMOS digital integrated circuits have high immunity to noise on the input signal or power supply? Surely. It is because the input threshing, uh, in, input switching threshold is about one half of the power supply voltage. Has high noise immunity. So what best describes a pull up or pull down resistor? Bravo. It is a resistor connected to either the positive or the negative supply line. It's used to establish a voltage when an output uh, or input is an open circuit. It's, it could float into that indeterminate region otherwise. So what is the schematic symbol for a NAND gate? Well, alpha. Well, that's a that's an number five. That, that's an or, that's an AND gate. Bravo. Bravo. Number five, but we can't see it. Uh, oh, we can't see. Well, here's here's number five. <laughs> no, it's it's the, Bravo. Yeah, it is Bravo. This is a, Bravo. an AND gate because it's got the straight line, remember, and it's got mm. the the inverting dot. So yeah, uh, it, the answer is number two here, B. And what is a programmable logic device? Bravo. Delta. It is Bravo. Bravo. Uh, it's a programmable collection of logic gates and circuits in a single integrated circuit. All right. Which is the schematic symbol for a NOR gate? Charlie. Delta. Oh, NOR. Delta. Yeah, Delta. Yep, Delta. It's this one right here. It's an Maybe OR gate. More. With a with the knot on the output or the, the inverter on the output. So yep. All right. And what is the schematic symbol for the knot operation? Charlie. Do we see that? Knot mm -hmm. is just an inverter. This is Charlie. kind. Of, I, I look at this as an amplifier with an inverter. So yeah, it's a five, Charlie. And which circuit is bi-stable? Charlie. A Charlie. flip or a flop. Flip it's flop. got two stable states, yes. And what is the function of a decade counter? Charlie. Nope. Alpha. Alpha. Oh, Alpha. I got him, yeah. Yeah, it's, it counts. It, so it's counting yeah. up to 10 input. Yeah. And which of the following can divide the frequency of a pulse train by two? Bravo. That Bravo. is a JK flip-flop. Oh, yeah. And how many flip-flops are required to divide a signal by four? Bravo. Bravo. So if one will divide by two, two will divide by four. So answer is B. And which of the following is a circuit that continuously alternates between two states without an external clock? Delta. Delta. It's an A-stable, or not stable at all, multivibrator. And what is a characteristic of a monostable multivibrator? Alpha. It switches momentarily Alpha. to the opposite binary state and then returns to its original state after a set time. This is a debounce circuit for a mechanical switch. And what logical operation does a NAND gate perform? Delta. And this is one you're going to probably have to go over a bunch of times to, mm -hmm. to figure it out and look at those truth tables. Uh, an AND gate would produce a, a logic 1 if any of the inputs are 1. Um, but with the inverter on the output, it produces logic 0 at its output only when all inputs are mm -hmm. logic 1. Right. Okay, what logical operation does an OR gate perform? Alpha. 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 Alpha is correct. 
And what logical operation is performed by an exclusive NOR gate? Oh. <laughs> yeah. No. no, 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 Charlie. So the answer is, in fact, Charlie. It produces a logic oh, zero Charlie. at its output if only one input is logic one because of the exclusive function. So what is a truth table? Charlie. Charlie. It is a list of inputs and corresponding outputs for a digital device. And what type of logic defines one as a high voltage? Delta. 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 That's Delta. positive logic. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the chapter. You made it back just fine. <laughs> Any questions before we go tonight? Where's the Tylenol? <laughs> <laughs> ah! So, Dave, what's up for next week? Okay, let me um, get my audio turned on. Okay. Got to push the buttons okay, back Okay, here. here we go. All right, I think... Um, Okay, we're, we're all set. So next week, we're going to be into Chapter 6. Chapter 6 has got five sections. It's a pretty long chapter. And we're going to be doing it over two weeks. So we're going to just deal with Section 6.1 and 6.2 for next week. That'll be plenty to deal with. Uh, we're, we're going to consume the entire two hours very easily. That runs up to page 6-25 in the book. And of course, I'll get this out in an email, but sometimes that's delayed a couple couple days after Tuesday. So uh, just want to let you know it's 6.1 and 6.2 for next week, up to page 6-25 in our, in our book. There's a lot of material here, very similar to what Gary covered tonight in terms of density. Uh, but it's, and some of these will be new concepts, so it'll be handy if you possibly can look at the last time that we taught this that way you'll be seeing it for the second time next week so hang on we're gonna we've got a lot more exciting things to cover you're gonna make it you're doing just fine yes you hang are. in there and uh, we'll see you all next week 73 next week. cheers take care good night thank you thank you thanks guys good night question guys Did somebody say they had a question?